Uh, good evening, everyone, dear colleagues uh, and friends, uh, to this evening session uh, at the European Charcot Foundation meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the symposium of the MS21 or MS in the 21st Century Initiative. Um, um, and the symposium has the title Knowledge is Power, but is Ignorance Bliss? And uh, in a minute from now, I'm going to introduce a little bit more into the topic. Uh, but I thought, before getting into details, um, I'd like to introduce you a little bit more with the MS in the 21st Century Initiative, or MS21, as we say. MS21 was founded and still is a joint healthcare professional and patient initiative with a focus on improving um, communication and education of uh, patients and the communication between patients and their peers and healthcare professionals. Um, the group works collaboratively with a patient board and a physician's or neurologist's board to um, improve um, patient care in essence. And we also do this, for example, by providing um, uh, publications, uh, review, peer review publications on topics that in collaboration and in a joint discussion with patients we deem as being very important in improving care and outcomes in patients with multiple sclerosis. And the latest example that I'd like to share, and I'm really proud to share with you, is the one that you found on your uh, seats this night, which is uh, the publication first authored by one of our members of the um, uh, faculty tonight, David Yendel. Uh, it's called Patient Power Revolution in MS, Navigating the New Frontier. And it's actually a nice summary of last year's meetings that was held exactly on the same occasion at the Charcot Foundation meeting uh, back in 2017. Um, this is the one that you all have or should have on your uh, desks. Now, why have we identified disease progression as a major topic to discuss between patients and healthcare professionals? Now, we ourselves did a survey among patients and also HCPs and that showed that 25, around 25% um, of patients report never ever having discussed topics on disease progression with their healthcare professionals. Another group, Dennison and colleagues, found that up to 50% of patients report never having discussed long-term prognosis with their healthcare professionals. And we believe, both healthcare professionals and patients believe, that communication around disease progression or negative interactions might adversely affect patient engagement in care and treatment. And this is why we thought this is a fantastic topic to share between patients and healthcare professionals and also to discuss uh, between the faculty of tonight and you um, as uh, colleagues in the field. I have a wonderful faculty uh, with me tonight that I'd briefly like to introduce you. Um, we've got two patient representatives. Uh, one is uh, Jane Shanahan. Uh, she's a member of the uh, patient uh, steering group from the UK, as is David Yendel, uh, who is the uh, first author on the paper that, you, uh, that we're sharing tonight with you, uh, also from the, from the UK. Two colleagues from the uh, HCP board, um, also one from the UK, which is uh, Professor Dawn Langdon. It's a pleasure to have her with, you, with us. She's a, um, a professor of neuropsychology and uh, director of the health and medicine um, a faculty at the Royal Holloway and the University of London. Welcome, Dawn. And also, pleasure to have you with us, Patrick, uh, Professor Patrick Vermeersch, who's the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and the Head of the Department of Neurology at the University of Lille in France. <coughs> pleasure to have you all with us tonight. I'm looking forward to a wonderful discussion. Um, we've got a um, pretty dense program, um, and we thought we, or we have organized the, uh, the session and the discussion into three or um, uh, arranged three major topics. Um, so we're going to have a um, first uh, uh, a brief uh, a talk from, from uh, Don Langdon on communicating disease progression and current understandings. Uh, we're going to discuss that between healthcare professionals and the patients. Um, um, and we've got three major questions that we would like to share with you, and we're going to have repeated uh, panel and interactive discussions with you. And I might even join you in the audience uh, if you don't feel like you want to engage yourselves in the discussion. So be prepared. One is on the potential benefit of discussing um, a disease progression with patients. So what kind of general, more general benefit may that have on disease outcomes? 
um, and on patients' well-being. Um, um, the next one is a more, I would say, individualized one or a very subjective one. And I would even like to encourage you, uh, both in the panel and in the audience, to really share your personal, very individual and subjective thoughts on do you really think that patients, and your experience also as physicians, do you think that patients want to know about disease progression? And what is the way that they try to engage you in a discussion? And what is the, the kind, of, kind of information that they want to have? And the last point, uh, which is a very important one then obviously, is when and how do patients want to learn about the topic of disease progression? When is it? that this is something that should be discussed. Is it the first visit? Is it uh, when you have a very kind of close uh, relation with your patients? And what is the right way of engaging your patients into discussions on disease progression? So as I said, it's a very dense schedule for the next hour or so, um, and I will try to keep um, all of us um, uh, on time. This being said, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we will be asking you for um, your um, uh, questions and thoughts throughout the debate. Uh, please feel free to join in whenever you feel like. Uh, we're going to have mics in the audience uh, that people are going to distribute um, um, and uh, help you to speak up. Please also remember, and I'd really like to urge you to fill out this form, which is the second thing that you find on your t uh, uh, chairs, which is the feedback form. Uh, it's not only presenting the, the faculty, but also having some questions for you guys and, and the rating formula. Please fill that form before you leave. No one should leave this room without having filled this form, actually. <laughs> Last not least, and I love this housekeeping note, fire exits are at the back of the meeting room. There is, to share this with you, no scheduled fire alarm supposed to go off during today's <coughs> symposium, which means that, in essence, if a fire alarm goes off, leave this room. <laughs> because it's a true one, okay? And please kindly switch off your cell phones um, or put it on mute um, so that we can have a, a fruitful and good discussion. With this being said, I'd like to hand over to Professor Don Langdon. Will you do Thanks the slides? Would you do the slides? Of course. Lovely, thank you. Sure. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I think we're all aware that even in the academic community, disease progression is a controversial topic, ongoing debates around the accuracy of the existing classifications. It's complex and full understandings reliant on long-term specialist training and even then an accurate long-term prognosis is often unclear. But disease progression, we know, has the largest impact on patient quality of life and slowing or preventing disease progression is the primary goal in the MS treatment. So, how do patients perceive progression? Well, it's often a confusing topic, partly because information is fragmentary or wrong or provided on the internet. There have been calls for more patient-friendly language. Many patients will tell you that just the word progression produces an almost visceral reaction. Patients often prefer a more patient-oriented care approach, looking at symptoms and daily life. And a sense of the inevitability of the neurodegeneration could leave them feeling hopeless and perhaps give up on treatment. <coughs> So why is communication so important? Well, the communication quality is really key, as we all know. And this is linked with patient satisfaction and empowerment, levels of conflict and litigation, and treatment adherence. And I think, you know, we can all own up that negative experiences with healthcare professionals can impact a patient's future engagement with services. So we need to set the tone right at the start for the whole pathway of the disease. And poor quality communication around disease progression can affect patients' well-being, mood, and their engagement with services, really, for the whole of their disease. So very important topic this evening, and um, handing back to the chairman now. Thanks very much, Dawn. Um, so against this background, um May I um, ask the panel first uh, to, to share their thoughts on um, the question, are disease progression discussions beneficial in a kind of broader concept uh, when communicating uh, with patients? May I ask you, Dawn, to, to start? 
Well, just a few words on that. My view is that for a person to understand the importance of treatment adherence and what the risks and benefits of any treatment is, they have to know what the underlying disease progression story is. And if they have that, they can form realistic expectations about the goals of their treatment. And there's also an issue about patient healthcare professional trust. If patients learn about progression from other sources, it's almost like important information has been withheld from them. And so it's not necessarily a good thing to say nothing. Just to reinforce that from my own personal experience, I think it's really important. I found, and I know other patients have found that I've spoke to, that you know, we learn about progression from a whole variety of different sources. That could be other patients, it could be the, the media generally, it could be the internet, and it could be social media. Uh, and it's important for ensuring that trust and confidence that needs to be built between the healthcare professional uh, and the patient. The patient doesn't feel that their doctor is uh, withholding information or not telling them the, the full story. Um, we want to know the full story. Thanks, David. Now, um, these were the, the pros, so to speak. Now, uh, maybe, Jane, you want to share some cons with us? From a patient perspective, I feel that timing is key. Um, we might not be ready emotionally, um, having newly been diagnosed, or have other health issues to consider. Patrick. Um, yes, I not fully agree with Dawn, because between nothing and all the picture, maybe it's difficult to give to know the good position. Because even you think you know very well your patient, but it's not true. It's very difficult to, to know what the patients want to know, really. And maybe what you will give, the, what information you will give, the full picture. So you will say, of course, you need to, to take a, a, a treatment, to have a treatment, but we are no clear data concerning maybe the impact, the long-term impact of your treatment concerning disease progression, that's clear, no consensus. For a large majority of the patients, you don't know, really. It's difficult to know uh, and to control the emotional impact, the possibility of a depression, if you give the full picture, maybe some consequence concerning the family planning, for example. People can say yes, because the, some risk, the high risk of disability progression after five or 10 years, maybe to change a lot of things, family planning, maybe to discuss about the job. So because it's impossible to know what will happen. I think we need to give information at the good time, possibly, but not completely convinced for all the patients you, you need to anticipate all the informations, to be honest. You can discuss that point, but it's a point of view. Thanks very much, Patrick. Are there immediate thoughts or comments from the audience that you would like to share with us? There's one over there. <coughs> be that there are different uh, psychological profiles with the some wanting to know more and uh, others wanting to know less. So maybe with the right questionnaire or something like that, you could identify the different profiles and personalize the amount of information given. Right. Thank you. Can I ask you for, for the next comments just to briefly uh, share with us where you work and where you're from? Just briefly kind of introduce yourselves, uh, maybe country and, and city where you work in. Other questions or comments? Thoughts? Yes, please. I'm, uh, I'm from San Raffaele Hospital from Milan, Italy. Thank you. Other comments? Maybe I've got a question. Uh, while listening to your, to your thoughts, basically, I was, I was wondering, and I make this a question both to you and, and the audience at the same time, are we sure that we have a shared terminology when it comes at all, when it comes to discussions about progression? So in essence, what are we talking about as physicians when it comes to topics of disease <coughs> progression or even progressive disease? Is that the same or are these two things? 
And what may patients anticipate when it comes to discussions about progression, is that the same thing? Are we talking about the same thing here at all? Patrick. Um, maybe I think we discuss about disability progression much more than disease progression itself, you know. Uh, maybe I think we need also to, with the patient to, dif to differentiate the two concepts, activity, maybe relapse, MRI evolution. I think patients are maybe okay to discuss that impact very early because we give treatment to control this aspect clearly. But also we need to discuss about disability progression. So including also some MRI atrophy or something like that because the, when they read the MRI uh, five, maybe something, yes, the radiologist says some degree of atrophy. So maybe I think most of the patient could discuss the two aspects. Uh, even I'm fine with to discuss in this position of ignorance is based to, to say that we have drug uh, and we need to, 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 to be treated because we control this inflammatory component of the disease. No? I agree. I'm not fully agree to discuss all the aspects of the progression. Right. No. Uh, something to yeah, I was, David. Can I just, I just want a couple of points about this terminology, because I do think terminology is really important. Um, I mean, I think certainly, and it may be a problem in, this doesn't work, this isn't an issue in other languages, but certainly in English, progression in, in this context is very, a very negative connotation. And I think in some ways it would be better if we used slightly more um, encouraging words or slightly different terminology and one word that we looked at, I know when we were talking about this, was evolution rather than progression. And I think there's also an issue about the confusion between disease progression and actually progressive MS. And I think there is that, I think the concept, I think there is a concern that a lot of people, patients have that because they've been told their disease is pro progressing, they automatically assume that they may have progressive MS, which of course is not necessarily the case. And I think therefore, in a way, if we can find a terminology that is uh, more um, neutral, if I can put it like that, uh, than progression, uh, and doesn't create this confusion, that would be quite helpful. And I think that's a big challenge for all of us. That may not be a, an issue in other languages, but certainly in English, I think it is a problem. Yeah, I think that's a very beautiful example that the concepts, obviously, on either side may be different. So when it comes to, to disease progression and when physicians talk about this, usually, as you said, uh, Patrick, this refers to disability worsening, doesn't it? So we're talking about dis largely about disability, which is kind of restricted to the kind of functional systems that we assess in daily routine adequately, whereas we might miss or might be missing others, cognition, for example. Well, I mean, I think it's certainly true that, you know, if a patient arrives and they say, I feel worse, as far as they're concerned, their disease is progressing but it may not, um, that may not be picked up on MRI or, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the EDSS. And, you know, being very fatigued or having a, a very bad mood episode is going to be just as debilitating for the patient. So I think this sort of failure to capture so many of these invisible symptoms also causes problems with um, doctors and patients understanding and discussing progression. Right. Agree. Uh, thoughts from the audience on that one. Um, how do you how do you kind of reassure yourselves that you're talking about the same thing when it comes to discussions about progression uh, progression in multiple sclerosis? Or are you sure in your environment in your countries that you're basically talking about the same thing as uh, we do as patients do when it comes to disease progression? Please. I'm Marie, neurologist in Belgium. Um, I think it's very important hi, uh, to, to listen to the patients when they have these complaints, these invisible complaints, because it's very important to take them serious and to acknowledge them, to recognize them, even if we don't find any changes in EDSS and, it's, and in the MRI. It's telling us something because it's also very confusing for patients. I have these complaints and nothing is being remarked or observed by the neurologist by the examinations. That's one point. The other point is if patients are, uh, if we are talking, I, I agree there's quite some uh, confusion about progression. And uh, as we heard also the presentations this afternoon, there may be very silent progression and there may be clear secondary progression that patients 
uh, are observing their progression, that we are seeing the progression, that we have <coughs> confirmed there is some progression, even if nothing is seen on the MRI of the brain. This is really like the silent progression is it's very much difficult to say your progressing patients are doing quite well, it's going very slowly, it's not, maybe you could question is it like an aging effect, uh, aging is also a, a progressive disorder or it's also having some effects, so this difference between clear secondary progression and the very silent uh, uh, evolution uh, maybe role of aging, of less, being less able to be active, to train the brain, to train the, the functions. So it might also have some effects and some silence progression, which is not kind of the same. Right. Can I ask you, and maybe others also in the audience, anyone who wants to comment on that, is, are you assessing um, this kind of progression or disease worsening uh, systematically by whatever means beyond the EDSS and maybe questionnaires on fatigue. Is there any kind of systematic way that you're assessing that in your, your nodding, uh, Dominic? Yes, we, we, we check. You got a microphone? <coughs> we check uh, systematically you also, some... Uh, for the others, briefly state where you're from. And my, my name is Dominic Deep from Liège in Belgium. Uh, we, 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 check, we, we test systematically some uh, functional aspects beyond EDSS because of uh, EDSS is uh, not an easy way to evaluate patients. Everybody knows that this scale is not ordinal, which, uh, this scale is not linear uh, between some steps, so it, it's quite difficult to, uh, to use EDSS at the individual level and um, uh, more uh, specific uh, um, uh, clues like uh, nine hole pack test, 25 feet walk, uh, like uh, SDMT of course, uh, have to be systematically evaluated for patients. And we try to use uh, L, um, uh, personal uh, patient related outcomes uh, like scales and I hope in the future it, w it will be easier to use those scales uh, through electronic device, for instance, uh, in order to have more uh, direct information coming from patients, uh, from subjective patients' uh, evaluation. So I, I think uh, in the future we, we cannot continue to use simple EDSS to evaluate the, the disease. And uh, with that, disease progression definition could be changed in the future. So it's a kind of systematic and structured approach asking patients beyond the EDSS. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. I, I, I will be a little bit provocative, but I think this discussion is a little bit out of the topic. I agree to have a systematic assessment of all functions. It's completely different at the early stage of the disease to discuss with the patient of the possibility of a progressive and silent <coughs> decline. I do a screening test like SDMT, for example, in most of my patients. But maybe it's different to say at the early stage, to, at the time of the diagnosis, to say, yes, you know, possibly that the majority of patients you will have as a slow decline on some testing. It's a completely different aspect, of, uh, I think. You know? I'm not in favor to say early. Yes, you will have a small decline, but, however, I will do some tests. But when you're assessing it, Patrick, may I just add a question to that? So when you're assessing it systematically and in a structured way, how do you communicate that with your patients? You should say something. You should say com or comment on why you are doing this, what this tells you in the kind of evolution of the disease, maybe not necessarily with the first, but with the second and third visit. What are you communicating then? I think yes, it's important to communicate and to anticipate a little bit the results you will have with the test. It's like an MRI. You know, as an MRI, you need to anticipate what you will say to your patients when you have the results in front of you. Of course, I say that it's part of the global evaluation of the disease. You know, uh, I, maybe I benefit at the time we give a treatment to, to have the impact, to have the assessment of the impact of the drug. I think, I think it's a, one of the good ways. Maybe can I ask you guys again in the audience, is there, uh, so who communicates this, this topic early on and, and, and what are the potential benefits that you think comes with the discussion on, on disease progression and multiple sclerosis? Is there anyone who wants to share that? Um, Oscar. Uh, 
uh, I don't want to be provocative, but communication is a technique and an art, actually. And the first consideration should be the cultural background. I mean, here we have people from many countries, and in my country, probably the communication is different from the communication in France or in Italy, and let's say completely different in Germany. So first thing. Second thing, uh, basically, uh, everything has to be to told to the patients, has to be told, but uh, depends when and to who. Patients are different. There are, it has been mentioned, but we have had studies already done years ago. There are like four types of different patients, and some of them are very well informed and young, and some of them don't want to know at all. So it's very simple. Communication has some principles which are very basic. I ask my patient, what do you want to know? It's as simple as that. What do you want to know? And uh, probably I will get the information very slowly, because uh, sometimes they want to know, but they don't want to know at the same time. So it depends. And it depends. And probably at the very beginning, as Patrick mentioned, uh, uh, maybe we don't know either. So I will tell the truth, but I will not tell you that you will progress or not. And finally, it's so simple to ask, do you understand me? Because if they understand me, I don't need... I have understood everything. If not, uh, I will can't tell you again. I, I think this is as simple as that. I kind of fully agree Culture, with you. Cultural background. I agree. Patient differences and the truth. Truth must be always there. I very much. I cannot agree more with you, Oscar. Obviously, um, this was one of the reasons why I said, please tell where you're working and which country you're coming from, because I thought there may be differences. <laughs> I fully agree. I don't share your op optimism, though, to to 100%. I, sh I would say because when I ask my patients, "Have you understood what I've just been saying?" Most patients say yes. And when the second question comes, could you tell me in your own words uh, what I've been trying to tell you, then I got the feeling that not always everything came across. So I've obviously not always done a good job. I'd love to share your optimism about this, uh, the communication issue, but, but I still think there's, some, some, uh, there's still some, some time that we need and some improvement. Just to, to finish this first section, I've, I've just one question, very, very straightforward. Is there anyone who'd like to share with us who's convinced that talking about disease progression with some ill-defined terminology here, um, who's convinced that this is beneficial for patients, that's important and beneficial, and who would like, would like to share the benefits that comes with this talking about disease progression with us. Is there anyone who's convinced in the audience at all? No one. Giancarlo. <laughs> Carlo. <coughs> and share with us oh, why, please. I think I fully agree with the Oscar position, but there is some exception. And the exception is when you have to face a patient in the very early phase that has an aggressive presentation. And then you have to propose the patient might be to take risks for a given treatment. In this case, it's really mandatory to expose the patient which are the risks, which are the benefits, and why you recommend such an aggressive action. Otherwise, the patient... Uh, when, as you know, it is always very difficult for the patient in the initial phase to accept, to take risks. Later, the patient is able to accept all the risks, but at the beginning, it's a very delicate. So, uh, again, it's, it's really, uh, again, has to be also adapted to the specific condition. Uh. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Um, um, and we are advancing to the second question, which kind of was um, already um, anticipated by, by uh, <coughs> Fernandes. And this is the question, um, do patients want to know about disease progression? Do they themselves want to know? And as I said in the beginning, um, I'd really like to ask you, um, before I hand over to the, to the panel again, I'd really like to ask you to share your very subjective thoughts on that one. Keep in mind that not necessarily anyone who's arguing pro or con in the panel is um, subjectively convinced that this is either good or bad, necessarily. So they're not speaking uh, uh, or talking about their own opinions. But um, let's go to the second question, actually. And uh, um, um, may I ask you, Jane, to, to comment on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I as a patient, um, do we really want to know about the disease progress progression? Or is it something that we need to know? Um, you know, it's... Again, it's something that um, we can be sort of bogged down with the, the volume of information available to us as patients. Um, 
And, uh, and as every patient can tell you, uh, that we, we obviously uh, research it, uh, the information up on the internet, and we get baffled by the information given, if, if it's correct, incorrect, um, too technical, um, not enough easy to read, um, you know, evidence. Each patient will have, you know, the same journey, so that, that has something to, to bear in mind too. Thank you. Patrick? Uh, I think it's really a case-by-case -case analysis, I think. It's a very di difficult task. I think we need to discuss a lot with the patient to, to maybe to know what really <coughs> the patients want to know, you know, to some extent. Of course, it's very difficult. It's very challenging, really. But to, I'm not sure that too much information is important because you need, we need, I think, to go step by step. Maybe to discuss also with a specialized nurse. I think it could be a key point we'll discuss later, perhaps. But I think again, no, no, no. Maybe to, if you, you want to, to give, if you need, if you want to go to the f f full picture, you need to discuss all the aspects. The intermediate situation is <coughs> very difficult in this aspect. So to discuss about cognition, to discuss about sexual problems, uh, urinary disturbances and so on. So maybe and to say, really, we, I'm not sure the treatment we will give to you will control this aspect. And to be honest, we have no symptomatic treatment to control it. You know? So it's difficult to know um, uh, what patients want to know exactly, specifically. It's uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, too ambitious to say that to a specific patient in front of you, I think. And how after, how to control the emotional aspect of that. Maybe. Um, well, I, I think that um, I think that doctors should be prepared to discuss progression and all the aspects with people with MS, because I actually think, and I'm going to be a bit controversial now, I actually think it's easier to say, oh, they won't want to know, or it might be difficult, or there might be some emotional fallout. But actually, you know, some patients are going to have a worse view of MS than is actually real. And they're going to be living with an unrealistic fear of imminent disability, which is going to affect how they interact with you and their clinical service and their treatment and disease management. So whenever possible, I would say, with the usual clinical sensitivity, <coughs> should have as much information as possible to give to your patients. And I think that will help to engage them, particularly with treatment adherence and other disease management aspects, constructive life choices to slow progression, and keep them on board with you so that you can set the right tone for the um, pathway of their disease. Yeah, just to, to supplement that, my, my personal experience is that having a better understanding of how your disease might progress can help motivate patients that I've spoken to and myself to take greater responsibility for aspects of their lifestyle um, that could affect the progression of their disease. And I, I remember vividly when my, uh, when my GP, um, after I'd been diagnosed uh, with MS, um, I went to see my GP, uh, and she said to me, well, David, um, I'm afraid we haven't at this stage got a cure for MS. One thing I will say to you is do everything you can to look after the rest of your body and your brain as well as you can do. And that has motivated me to do things like having regular physio, having um, uh, exercising as frequently as possible, making sure I keep my brain active by doing things like this, for example. Um, certainly keeps your brain active, this does. Um, eating as healthily as possible, that's not sure that that's necessarily what we're doing here, but never mind. Um, but also even making alterations to your home to prepare for things that might come down the road. So for example, I remember very quickly, I, I, I had a wet room put in my room to make it easier for me to be able to, to shower and do things. I didn't need it at that time, but now I find it really useful. I'm glad I did it. Glad I made that. Inv I see it as an investment in, in my future, if you like. Thanks very much, David. So, um, how about you guys? Um, thoughts on, or your experience with your patients? It's a very basically personal question. Please, do patients want to know? 
Can you have a microphone up front here? There's one down. Lady here. My name is uh, Michaela Krause, coming from Munich, Germany. Um, personally, I can tell you my personal uh, experience with uh, my patients. Um, at the beginning, when uh, MS is diagnosed, I think most of the patients don't want to know about disease progression. They are uh, overwhelmed with a uh, diagnose and uh, just, I think at that fa phase, they don't want to know about p uh, disease progression. I think it's important <coughs> to tell the patients how uh, Professor Komi said, uh, when it's very aggressive, so you have to tell them immediately. But when it's uh, going the, uh, so that you have first uh, treatment, uh, first line treatment, and then you see that the patient is going on assessing it with uh, several uh, instruments, but also asking them for the quality of life and activity of daily uh, life, so hobbies and work, and so you see his worsening, then I think this is the right moment to uh, tell the patient uh, what's going on. Normally, uh, we see the patients after six months, after three months, and, and uh, after uh, the first uh, therapy, and when we see the uh, disease is progressing, I think this is the right time to tell them in uh, in this time after after six months, so you can tell him and tell him the patient what he has uh, he has to observe himself. And this, I think, this is good for the adherence when you tell him at this time, but not immediately if it's not an aggressive uh, type. Thank you. So let's. Maybe uh, not talk about the timing because, uh, uh, of the discussion because this is something we're going to cover with the last question, but maybe more about the question, do patients want to know in your experience? Uh, first there, then here up front. Um, two brief comments. Keith Edwards, Albany, New York, which is north of the big city. Um, <laughs> four or five years the ago, big city. I said to a patient who was doing perfectly well that he was going to probably have a normal life, and, and he said, oh, you mean I'm not going to be in a wheelchair? So he ha had this com concept. Um, but what, uh, what Professor Langdon, what Mr. Yandel just said, I think is very true. Can you imagine a group of uh, oncologists or cardiologists even having a seminar like this? We neurologists are very bizarre. We're 30 years behind the time. Of course our patients want to know. Thank you. It was a clear comment here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Albrecht from Munich, Germany. Uh, in my patients, I see all the, have seen all the arguments that the panel was discussing. So uh, I had uh, one patient, as uh, Professor Langdon told, uh, she had very bad information about the uh, disease and uh, she was a young mother with a little baby and I have to tell her the diagnosis and she started immediately crying and said, okay, now I have MS and I know <laughs> with this disease I have to die within one year. So this was <laughs> very bad information. And uh, at a whole, uh, it's, I'm, I'm treating MS patients since 1988, maybe <clears throat> about 15,000 until now. <clears throat> and it, it's a very, very, very individual thing. You have uh, a patient group who don't want to know uh, the, uh, about the disease at the beginning. And I always um, discuss very openly the conflict you have as a doctor with that uh, uh, thing. So I see, okay, you have now, you had your first relapse, you are remitted completely, and I have now to tell you to take uh, uh, a medicine for uh, which can have side effects and so on and I will discuss with you uh, why I am doing so and then we come in discussion but it's also right some patients uh, need about uh, two or more uh, consultant uh, dates to uh, 
um, discuss this properly. Thank you. Um, maybe just one comment from my side. I, I, as much as I agree that, that uh, asking is the right way, um, I think that, and I, this point came nicely up, uh, up nicely in the comment from the colleague from, from uh, the US, and relates to, to one of the comments that, that Dawn made. Um, to be honest with you, when you ask patients, do you want to know about progression and about your prognosis, and patients that step back immediately and say, well, no, 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 thanks, I don't want to talk about this, maybe now, but um, I don't want to talk about this, makes it very easy for us to step back as well, okay? That is the moment where you can say, oh, good Lord, nothing to talk about progression and not the bad news, thanks, next time maybe. So it makes it easy for us. I think that at least to some extent, and I would say to a significant extent, in many of these patients, there's this misconcept of MS as an autoimmune condition, even in 2018, that within a reasonable time frame lets you end up in a wheelchair or with significant disability. And I think we all agree in this room that things have changed in multiple sclerosis, luckily. There are good news to convey to patients. And as much as there's a lot of uncertainty about prognosis and individual disease causes, there are so many good news to tell our patients. And I think that it's worthwhile to ask again and again and really get a flavor of why the patient steps back from the idea of learning about progression, multiple sclerosis, and prognosis in general. Can I ask maybe yeah, can I just, David and Jane to well, comment can, can on that I, one? Can I just, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. That, I mean, one of the problems and one of the things I get very angry about is that the media, whether it be television, whether it be films, whether it be uh, the newspapers, have a very bad depiction of MS. Um, and uh, I think it's a real problem. And we need better role models out in, the, out in the real world, if I can put it like that, to demonstrate that actually, even though you've got MS, you can live a pretty normal life. Um, and that it's not a sort of, you know, I wouldn't say it's a death sentence, but it's a sort of sentence of a very bad life. Uh, and that's, I think sometimes, a lot of people don't want to talk about disease progression because they fear they're going to get this awful bad news. When actually, if they actually did open up and talk to, get the physician to talk to them, they might actually find it's not as bad as they thought it was. And I think we have to try and get over that burden. But I think that's a whole, that's a whole new, you know, that's a whole another area to talk about is the whole sort of, you know, the image of MS and MS patients is, is a problem, I think. Can I say, you know, you can approach it gently. <coughs> you know, so the patient comes in to see you and you start chatting and you say, you know, and they say, oh, you know, it's going awfully and I, you know, it's so difficult for me with MS. And you can say, well, you know, most of the people in the waiting room have had MS for 10 years. You know, you can sort of, you know, go gently about progression and, and try and open it up. Unless you felt that was breaking confidentiality. I'm not sure that, would you want to use that breaking confidentiality? <laughs> but, it, you know, it's, it's funny that you mention that. What I sometimes do when it comes to kind of delivering the diagnosis and discussing prognosis with individual patients, and they kind of be, be uh, patients are less optimistic than we are maybe, and I go like, well, you, you've come through the corridor of our outpatient clinic, and I tell yeah. you, 50% of the people that you've been seeing may be or may not be patients yeah. from us. If I let you guess who's a patient and who's a co-worker of us, you, won't you will be right and wrong in 50%, which is yeah. guessing. Yeah. Okay, and this is the case, and this, is, this kind of tells them a story yeah. and they, they yeah. kind of start to understand, yeah. ah, there's something maybe about the disease that is not necessarily all bad. And I would even go this far, and I, I would even say there's evidence for that. For example, in a topic that we have been kind of touching upon, but it's not topic of today, which is sexual dysfunction. And I've, there's literature out there proving that kind of engaging in discussions about sexual dysfunction has even improved quality of life and sexual functioning and kind of satisfaction among patients with multiple sclerosis, simply by talking about this. And not kind of any, 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 any hit that we have in our questionnaire does not necessarily mean that everything is perceived as a deficit. It can even be an improvement of quality of life. This is the mal concept again. We're talking about concepts a little bit today uh, on patient side and healthcare professional side. And I think this is a mal concept that we have, that we believe anything that is going up on the EDSS scale necessarily is perceived as a worsening and a loss of quality of life. Maybe this is not necessarily the case in every in individual patient. Patrick? Uh, maybe I have a role today for ignorance. May I agree with David. It's our responsibility to uh, respond to questions. If the patients want to know, of course. But we discuss sometimes what kind of information to give to, 
concerning disease progression in all, for all the patients. Uh, maybe uh, to come back to uh, the, you mentioned about motivation down. I'm not sure in the literature we have significant data to say that when you give information to patients, you will really motivate the patient. How many patients you will motivate? How many patients you will depress about their disease? No, I think it, 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 it's a key question I also would like to ask. I would say there is some literature on that, at least that this is information that is digestible by patients and that they kind of, the, the, the feedback that we received, I've been doing this kind of research together with Christoph Hesen in Hamburg, uh, that this information is digestible and patients can handle this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this brings us kind of to the last uh, uh, question of today, and this has been touched upon uh, already, and this is a, um, a, a very important question then, obviously. Now, given that we maybe agree, at least to some extent, even Patrick uh, agrees on the fact that it's to some extent worthwhile of discussing topics of disease progression with individual patients, when and how should the information be provided? So, is it a matter of timing? of this kind of intervention and is it really a matter of how you convey this information and, and, and um, get the feedback of your patients. Um, there's obviously no pro and con uh, with this question, so we're going to handle this a bit differently. Um, can I ask um, David and Jane maybe? Can I, can I kick things off? Because I think one of the th issues that I think is quite important to talk about is who should be doing the communication? Um, now. My experience is I think that, you know, the consultant, the neurologist that you see on a hopefully fairly regular basis um, is the person who is, has the primary responsibility for the final decisions that are made about your, your health care. Um, and therefore, it's probably better that, that, that he or she should be the person who <coughs> initiates and probably manages the way in which that is communicated to you. It's not necessarily that they're the only person that communicates it to you, but that they should be in control of the management of that communication. I'm not sure that Dawn necessarily agrees with me on that, do you? Well, um, I always agree with you, Dave. <laughs> no, sorry, Jane, sorry. <laughs> Jane doesn't. Sorry. Well, um, I agree with you um, in some ways, but I also think, as a patient, I think um, sometimes you... Ha uh, patients have more accessibility to their MS nurses or their healthcare professional that they see um, maybe more often or are in contact more often um, with, um, that they can maybe discuss this in more detail. Um, but also take a, you know, the nurse maybe have a, has a bit more time to take a more holistic, uh, you know, approach to some of the questions that you might have and, um, you know, the information that can be given. Um, can, this can help tremendously overall um, with managing the disease on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Well, well, well I'd like to say <coughs> it's always the right time to offer this information to patients because, you know, there may be things happening in their lives, lifestyle decisions, they may be getting married, they may be having a baby, their wife may be having a baby, there may be employment choices, and really they need the best information about how their disease pathway is going to interact with the results of those decisions. And so I, I would urge you always to be alert to the patient's need for information and be ready to offer it in a way that's digestible, helpful, positive, so that they can not be <coughs> caught out by MS. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe I think, yes, we need to give informations probably for most of the patients relatively early, but not all the information probably. Probably not only the neurologist, but probably also a nurse. I think it's great to have a nurse with you uh, because to digest it's maybe frequently not easy. Uh, maybe a nurse can explain some points in a different way more digestible for patients, I think, with a different wording. Mm -hmm. uh, also, maybe a key point with also a, maybe a specific time, very challenging, I think, to give information. When in a specific period you think patient is switching from the relapsing remitting phase to the secondary progressive phase. I think it's the most challenging period, I think, for patient, but also for, for us to give uh, information to the patient, I think. 
Maybe I take up this question and, or point uh, that Patrick made in the end um, and um, ask you in the audience, um, is there, let's put it in a more general way, um, not necessarily talking about transitions in the, in the evolution of the disease, but are there vulnerable phases in the disease where you would argue it's maybe not the best time to talk about progression in multiple sclerosis? Are there vulnerable times, in other words, are there good times to talk about progression at the same time? And, and how, would you, how would you frame this and, and uh, how would you do this? Is it you giving this information or is it, is it uh, um, stuff from, from uh, the nurses or Bruce? Uh, Bruce Cree from uh, San Francisco, California, United States. So I, I think this discussion has been very interesting, but the thought that keeps coming to my head is, is thinking about how the diagnosis of MS has really changed earlier and earlier, largely as a consequence of the availability of treatment. Mm -hmm. It seems that the field today is right at the cusp of a transformation with respect to progressive multiple sclerosis. We have uh, top-line data from the saponamide clinical trial and secondary progressive MS, uh, the use of ocrelizumab in primary progressive MS, clinical trial that was successful of brain volume loss with abutilast, and uh, the first of two studies with uh, high-dose biotin MD-1003 being a positive trial in terms of alleviating disability. So I think as we get into a point where we have therapies that are options for patients who are progressing, our discussion of progression with patients is going to shift from something that we've been putting off and not wanting to discuss to something where we're going to want to discuss this much more closely, much more early. Think about PPMS. The diagnosis uh, is one that we would put off. Now we want to have those patients diagnosed before the age of 50 when they have GAD-enhancing activity because of the availability of ocrelizumab. So I think this is a, a, we're at a cusp and a change, and there's going to be a sea change in how we discuss, when we discuss, and what we talk about uh, with all of our patients. Please. Is there a gentleman in the third row? Hello. This is Marwan from Actinon Pharmaceuticals, but I'm talking as a caregiver of a patient, which is one of the elements that I didn't see it now to know the presentation. <coughs> and in fact, I have two comments on this. First of all, um, as I have seen how my partner was being diagnosed and how he lived all the process, it's like a breakup of a relationship with his life. He started by denial, depression, acceptance, and in each step, the need of information was totally different. And also the way it was given. His physician decided at the beginning not to give lots of information. Unfortunately, it's a really progressive case. So the only source was the internet. And on the internet, we know we have highly scientific things and something like you have a scratch, you have cancer. So it's quite differ, differ, difficult for a patient to know what to, how to understand and what to get. And I, as a, someone who works in MS, I was the one giving information. And I was the main source of information, which is quite complex as a caregiver. So. This, in this sense, I think caregivers should be implicated in the process of giving information because there's this sense, and there's another case also, we also, it affects our life. When he has a relapse, I also have a relapse in a different way, but I also live it. And in my career progression, I also need to take this element in choosing what to do and what, where to go. So just a comment, we should not forget caregivers. They can help a lot in the information because they trust us, we are their partners. And we can also find the proper way with the physician to give the proper information. Thanks very much indeed for sharing this, this very personal yeah. experience. Thank you, really. Asunta Dal Bianco, Vienna Neurologist. I also think that honesty is the basis for a good interaction between the doctor and the patient or people. And if you name it, you can frame it. So if you tell him or the patient that um, a chronic, anyway he knows, a chronic disease is progressive. So he will go into the internet and get wrong information. And to come back to, if you name it, you can frame it. You can then focus on comorbidities and focus on better lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And this gives the patient the power back. Thank you. I agree with 
being told. Uh, yes, hello. Egil Rösche, Oslo, Norway. Um, I find it quite strange that we are not talking about building more a com community around the patient. Because where, where I practice medicine or neurology, we try to make a community out of the doctor, the nurses, the caregivers, and other um, MS patients. So they can get information from a wide variety of different people with different aspects. So you would, um, maybe um, if you allow me to kind of uh, translate this further, you mean you would strongly recommend to build a, a team of people, multidisciplinary, um, kind of around the, the people with MS in order to convey this uh, information, maybe even from different angles. Is that correct? Uh, just to follow up, uh, we usually have these introductory uh, lectures for patients, if they want, obviously, where we invite the patients, their family, and there are nurses there, doctors, other patients, and they can, and we also relay information towards the, the different uh, organizations for patients. So we try to involve a lot of people so that they are not feeling that they're alone in this world <laughs> with the, their disease and that the only primary source of uh, information is either their doctor or the internet. I think that the value of, 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 of a, a multidisciplinary team for those services that have that luxury, not everybody does, is that it gives the patient a range of different professionals and personalities and it increases the chance of the patient finding someone that they can relate to easily. And then the team, as I know um, Patrick's team do, sort of share information and offer support appropriately. So in a sense that the team is working as an organism rather than a set of individuals by identifying and, and giving patients the right information. And for example, I know physiotherapists Patients often feel easier talking to physiotherapists because they have like the physical contact and that somehow breaks down some of the barriers. So um, I think uh, that's one of the values of the multidisciplinary team which isn't really captured. It's not just about having a range of professional expertise, it's about having a range of people. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, as a patient, you'll have different needs at different times and what you want is a holistic approach. You want, you, want, you want a joint, you want to make sure that everybody's talking to each other, but you will probably want to you know, ask different people at different times for advice and help. Uh, I think that's, that's inevitable, I think. And that's, that's, and, and that's an ideal scenario. I know it's not available everywhere, but it would be an ideal scenario. Yes, we have also this experience in France. Many, in many regions, we have, we have called a school of MS. You know, it's eight hours for early uh, diagnosis. It's uh, four times two hours with a neurologist, a psychologist, a radiologist, urologist yeah. also. We are quite lucky to have this possibility yeah, once a year, you know, specific. At, usually we do it at school, you know, yes, because I think it's great. And we systematically invite the caregivers and all, almost all the caregivers come to the, this teaching course also. Yeah. So um, maybe another personal note, uh, we've been talking about concepts uh, tonight quite a bit and, and um, um, I have, or in my personal concept, uh, in the way I deliver this kind of information, an important aspect is that, that I always try to partner up to the extent possible with my patients in the sense that in any chronic condition, I would strongly argue that it's important to either to build a team or as a multidisciplinary team, together with the patient, empower, through empowerment of the patient, it's important to partner up with him because I would say that delivering kind of the necessary information, prescribing drugs, prescribing physiotherapy, um, giving educational materials, 50% of our work, and I would say 50%, if not more, is being a partner for our patients and being there uh, kind of to discuss issues that they have. Um, and what I think is essential, uh, what I think is always important when, when I, have, uh, I feel that it was a good discussion and a good consultation with my patients is that I feel that the patient leaves um, the, the clinic with a concept of how it goes on for the next like one, two years. What are we going to do? 
what are the most important topics that I'd like to discuss uh, within the next few months, what is important in my private life, what needs to be solved, where are issues. And kind of in such a framework where you, where you build a concept together with your patient of how things go on, um, you can also easily talk about where aspects of the disease have become a bit worse and maybe even a bit better. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether we've still got the time to, to open again for a more general Q&A, but I think it's, uh, I get a kind of at least yellow, if not a red card already. So uh, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, and it, um, it's uh, uh, my honor just to um, conclude um, this session. I'm, I'm not going to uh, bore you with the different bullet points. I think um, I make this a more general summary in that there's no right and wrong, there's no black and white, obviously, uh, whenever it comes to treatment of MS and patient care, also in uh, concepts of how to deliver um, um, uh, aspects of disease progression, evolution of the disease. Um, I like that there's um, some ongoing discussion about the right terminology, and I think it's worthwhile to step back a bit and think about whether we have the same concept of what we're conveying there and whether the terminology is a shared one. If it's not the case, then let's share it. Uh, why not engage in discussions with, with people with MS, even in a broader audience where we involve patients more than we did tonight in order to, to get a better flavor of how we uh, get across this information. I would think that we also made clear that delivering information on progressive disease is not necessarily bad all the time. And there are, as, as Bruce Tree nicely said, there are also good news that we can convey even in the context of treating progressive conditions in multiple sclerosis, but certainly goes beyond that. Um, it's important to engage our patients and together with our patients in such discussions, and it's all about kind of communicating this and kind of confirming and reconfirming ourselves and being sure that we got the information across in a way that is digestible for patients and that they feel like they got something that they can take home and discuss further with their partners and peers and people that they think are the ones that they want to discuss this with. And then come back at the right time and to discuss how we can um, uh, develop this concept of progressive disease or progression in multiple sclerosis further. I think it became crystal clear that this is a very, very personal and subjective communication. So there's no general concept on how to convey aspects of disease progression in multiple sclerosis. There's no one solution fits all. Maybe different from country to country, maybe even different within countries, between centers or people at different stages of the disease. We haven't touched upon that, but I'm sure that you discuss aspects of progression differently in people that start with progressive disease as compared to patients that start with relapse onset multiple sclerosis. Uh, we also, um, I think, agree that timing is key and, and kind of dosing this discussion uh, appropriately to the individual demands of the patients is the way to go. And I think we also agree that there's a lot more to do. Um, and while I thought, well, discussing progression has been done a number of times, I will be going home talking about concepts again with novel concepts. Um, so I really learned something tonight. Um, I'd like to thank you uh, for your discussions. I've learned from you. I'd like to thank my colleagues and uh, especially um, uh, Jane and, and David for joining this tonight. You were certainly the minority, but certainly had a very loud voice that we all heard. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on this. I'd love to involve you more, and I hope that we're going to see more patients on similar occasions like this one. Um, I'd like to share with you that, that um, MS in the 21st century is not standing still, uh, and we have never been standing still, in that we have uh, tried to uh, come up with uh, different tools, such as um, communications tools that we uh, um, spread now and that are currently being validated in a randomized controlled trial in the UK at two sites. Uh, we have come up with different publications, some of them even uh, presented here, and papers just like the one from, from David and colleagues that is uh, shared with you and we have jointly diverged, uh, developed educational workshop at the major conferences uh, such as ACTRIMS or um, like the one uh, here in the symposium that we had here. So um, just stay tuned for the initiatives and involve yourselves. Um, uh, the initiative is open, uh, so if you feel uh, uh, that you want to uh, contribute and want to engage yourselves, feel free to do so. I'd like to thank you very much for your active contributions, uh, staying awake and uh, staying in this lively discussion even at a, at a late stage of today. Uh, thanks again, Dawn. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Thanks, Jane and David. Um, have a wonderful evening um, and a beautiful rest of the conference and enjoy the beautiful um, environment of Bavenio. Thank you very much.